All right, welcome to Underground Catholicism. My name is Elijah Yassi, and I have uh, a good friend of mine, Subdeacon Daniel Kakish, and he is a Syriac Orthodox seminarian. Uh, you guys, uh, a lot of you guys know him. Uh, we've done shows together, and uh, it's a pleasure to have him on. How are you today, uh, Subdeacon? I'm good. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you having me on. Absolutely, man. Thanks for being on. Um, so it's it's, uh, it's our pleasure here to have you. Um, it's it's going to be a very edifying show. And of course, I, I just like a couple of days ago, I did a show with uh, Father um, Patrick or Father John Ramsey. And uh, as I said before we started, is this is not a debate. This is not a gotcha. This is not where I'm trying to win. Subdeacon is not trying to win. Um, this is a dialogue, and and we. Um, the purpose of it is really to see how close we are in, in the teaching of the Immaculate Conception. Um, uh, what are our similarities? What are our differences? And of course, we're, we're going to be touching on the topic of original sin and the Immaculate Conception because they go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Um, and so, uh, you know, don't don't expect this to be like a bloodbath or um, things like that. It's not it's not like that, right? So, and and and. Uh, you know, there's a place for that on, on, on the, in the online apologetics world. People look for that. So if that's what you're looking for, um, I think you'll enjoy this more. Uh, it's not as uh, sexy, but it, it is uh, still um, edifying. But just like a lot of people were saying in the last show that we did, Immaculate Conception with Fathers, it was very edifying. So um, Subdeacon, why don't you... Uh, give a little background about yourself and then a little background about your uh, your church sure yeah uh, i'm a subdeacon in the syriac orthodox church like uh, elijah just said um i am studying currently at agora university almost done just finishing up my thesis there uh, in early syriac christology uh, before the fifth century <clears throat> and um i've been a subdeacon for going on five years this month yeah five years wow it's mm. been that long already huh <laughs> crazy huh yeah and and a lot of you don't know but uh subdeacon and i have been friends for how long has it been now it's can't i, I lost count what 10 years 10 more? years or something like that maybe more a little more 12 I think more time has fly, flown yeah. by i think it's a little more so uh, Subdeacon was uh, a Protestant when I first met him, and uh, we used to actually meet together um, occasionally with other Protestants and other Catholics, and we used to sit down and we used to dialogue about the faith, <clears throat> and um, that's how Subdeacon was introduced to the Church Fathers, and then, you know, he read the Church Fathers, and uh, thank God he left the Protestant world, and he entered the Apostolic world, and he where he's receiving real sacraments um so uh and thanks, I don't mean that. thanks to you thanks to you let me let me get into that a little bit if you don't mind. God, yeah yeah so, yeah go ahead i'm so, sorry so uh he uh, i didn't know what the church fathers were before elijah told me um and i'm a history guy like my first master's is in history so it never occurred to me to study the history of my own faith and he's like to me well you know, the, the the earliest Christians didn't interpret scripture like you are interpreting scripture. And I'm like, what? So I got into it. And from the first century, automatically, I'm like, wow, clearly I've been wrong, you know. And uh, one thing leads to another. And next thing you know, I'm Oriental Orthodox. Um, and me and Elijah, we have jokes about this all the time. But I, I'm, I'm really appreciative to you uh, for, for showing that to me still. Praise God! Absolutely, uh, that that's um, it's very exciting, and, and uh, there's a joke about that because uh, there was a, I think it was your cousin, right, uh, who was also a Protestant who became yeah. uh, Syriac Orthodox, and there's a joke that I'm really good at converting people to Syriac Orthodox, <laughs> Orthodoxy. But hey, I'll I'll take it, right? Because it's at least it's better than Protestantism. Um, no offense to people who are watching or Protestants. Um, obviously, I'm Catholic and I'm closer to the Syriac Church than I am to the Protestant Church, so. To me, it's closer to where the truth is. Um, and, and, and you know, a, a lot of you guys know me to where I, I don't sit here and, and, you know, debate people on the differences. I, I try to show more of the similarities, not in an ecumenist type of way, but in a real type of way where it's, it's a reality. It's not just like, hey, let, let's 
let's hold hands and talk about only what we agree on. But, you know, when I look at the differences, to me, it always seems like it's a difference of semantics and terminology. And I think this is what you're going to find on today's show, um, where Subdeacon and I have been talking about this topic uh, for, I don't know, five or six years. Um, and we, we have gone really deep into it. And, and I think it's exciting for us to finally share that online here with, with people to, to actually experience that with us and sort of get people updated on this topic because it's frustrating. As you would know, Subdeacon, when, when, when we talk to other Orthodox, whether it's Syriac or Oriental Orthodox, I should say, or Eastern Orthodox, when we talk about the Immaculate Conception, there's those common objections, you know, that you hear that I hope that people get past um, and then we can finally start the discussions and the dialogues, like like questions like, or not questions, but things like, well, this is a, a Western dogma, so it doesn't apply to our church. And mm. and I, I think, you know, uh, I'm going to show that it's not a Western dogma in the sense that the question of the American conception applies to everybody. It even applies to Protestants, right? Yeah. So, um, and, and I think this is where... Um, we want to advance the discussion, right? And another thing that you hear is, well, how, you know, you we believe that Mary was human. So, of course, uh, there is no immaculate conception because she was human. As if, you know, if you're immaculately conceived, that means you're not human, right? But, you know, I would say that you're more human than people that weren't immaculately conceived because, you know, humanity is to be pure. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, Sediment is asking if I grew my hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question, out, bro. You know what's going on, Sediment. So, uh, <laughs> Eliza, um, I, I would I would reframe the the statement, and it, let me know if you disagree. I would say the Immaculate Conception, as it's commonly thought, and in in the lexicon of the words Immaculate Conception, is. Um, might not be applicable to the East, but it could be framed in a way that the East has an understanding that could be reconcilable with it, right? Yes, yes, and and that that's that's what I'm excited to get into the the nitty gritty and the the original sin and things of that sort. So, as, as I did with um, with Father, I the first question I asked him, if I recall, is what? And I, I know you guys are are why well, you guys? I mean the Syriac. Uh, Orthodox Church, you guys are about to have a, a synod on original sin, and maybe talk about that a little bit before we get into the topic, just so people have like an understanding of the background. So I don't, I don't know if it's going to be like discussed imminently, like in this synod or or like when, but I know that it is like being discussed among the bishops. There are like uh, different views among the bishops right now within the Syriac Orthodox Church. They are talking about it. It is a, a, a controversial matter that there is disagreement on. So I'm guessing that, uh, if, you know, Middle Eastern people, eventually it's going to come to a head, right? And it'll eventually come to be at the the front of the conversation because it the the bishop's disagreement trickles down to the priests and from the priests it trickles down to the deacons and that's how we get a hold of it so um it's like oh my god this bishop is saying this thing and that bishop is saying that thing okay well what's the answer then let's figure it out um <clears throat> usually the synods tend to be around uh pastoral topics because of the the ability to bind and loose canons Right. So that is more practical for the people. Rarely do we get dogmatic ones. So that's really exciting. I don't know when again. I hope it's soon. I hope it's before the 2025 Nicaea thing. I hope it's before that. Um, let's see. Inshallah. And what is the 2025 Nicaea thing for those who are not familiar with it? Yeah. So uh, Pope Francis, I think, uh, was the one who called for uh, Nicaea 2025 among the apostolic churches. So Oriental Orthodoxy, Eastern Orthodoxy, um, Assyrian Church of the East, I, I think we're all going to be there. So uh, I think it's a commemoration of Nicaea 325. And the goal of it, as, as far as the goal of it is to figure out a common Easter date and maybe Christmas. But um, I'm not sure if it's going to get into anything more than that or, or even that. 
maybe it's just, hey, guys, nice to see you again. Yeah, and, and, and you and I always joke around is that yeah, you, our church is... I'm sorry, go ahead. You're on mute. I, I can't hear you. Are you on mute or no? Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? You guys can't hear me? What about now? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can oh, you're hear you. You're good. You're good. Okay. You okay. can hear me now? Yeah. You know, I was just saying, uh, you and I always joke around is that every time our churches get together, it's like they're they're discussing things that that we can that we already agree on, right? Like, hey, uh, what's the real spelling of Jesus' name in English, right? It's like, yeah, we agree on that. Like, hey, what does the, the sacrament of the Eucharist, what is that, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, we all believe what it is, same thing, right, Essenti yeah. essentially. Um, so hopefully they, they can um, sit down and discuss things that we don't agree on to move the conversation forward, right? And rather than just looking at things that we – that we agree on because um, it's always good to do both, but it seems like there's, we do more of the agreeing on than disagreeing on. And maybe that's because there is more that we agree on that we disagree on. And so uh, that's maybe a positive thing. Um, so touch upon original sin, um, the two sides that you guys have in your church today, and then touch upon what baptism is for you guys. I know that's a, it's a loaded question. So from what I understand, and to be fair, I haven't really spoken to anyone from the other side. I've heard people from the side that I know who told me what the other side are saying. You know, I haven't heard them from them directly. But from what I know, there are bishops saying, you know, the, the typical always original sin that we always talk about and everyone's used to, right? That the baptism takes it away, etc. And then <clears throat> there are there's the other side that is more of a Syriac purist side in a lot of ways, but in doing so, it might, and I don't know, I'm just giving the one side, like I'm just trying to put the other side's defense in it. I don't know, but it might do away with some things. They might be overlooking some other things by being Syriac purist. I'm not sure. So, um, so the, 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 the first side is, the, the the traditional original sin perspective that I think everybody is kind of familiar with, more or less. The other side is more of like, I guess, an ancestral type, sin type of thing. And it focuses instead in baptism, like the Syriac tradition does, of the rebirth more than the death. So it's like, what are we gaining, not what are we losing? You know? And... Uh, <clears throat> And they argue that the baptism rite doesn't say anything about original sin in it, uh, things like this. So there's almost, I don't know if, if one side is straw manning the other side by saying they don't believe in original sin, or if the other side really just doesn't believe in original sin. I'm not sure. Again, I haven't spoken to them. I've only heard from one side about them. Um, so those seem to be the two sides. Uh, your second question was what? Uh, baptism, which you're touching up on a little bit. Yeah. So in, in the Syriac tradition, baptism is regaining the robe of glory that Adam and Eve lost when they fell. So according to Syriac tradition and early Jewish tradition, um, when God made Adam and Eve, he gave them robes of glory. So there's uh, early rabbinical targums and interpret uh, exegesis of Genesis, where it's like when it's the, instead of talking about the animal skins after the fall, it talks about robes of glory that they had before the fall, so that when they sinned, they were stripped of them. So Jesus, when he took flesh and he was baptized, he left the robe back, he put it back in the water, so that everyone who's baptized now puts the robe back on. Like when uh, St. Paul says, you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Okay? So also there's a, an oral Syriac tradition um, coming down till today oral like it's spoken through the bishops and the old people, that uh, in the first century, when, when uh, after, after Jesus rose from the dead and ascension, Pentecost, the, you know how his, his uh, grave clothes were in the tomb, right? St. Peter, he used to wear the headpiece because it was separate. St. Peter used to wear the headpiece when he would celebrate the liturgy. Only St. Peter used to wear it. In Latin, right? <laughs> in Aramaic so, so uh, these clothes that were in the tomb though 
and the spices that he was anointed with when they went to anoint him, it's within these that the new Christians were being baptized. So literally physically putting him on his burial clothes and his what he was anointed in is the chrismation, is the mayron for us. So if whoever is watching, they don't know, like we do baptism and chrismation at the same time together. Okay, so they're chrismated with the same thing. We've had it for 2000 years. We keep remixing into the same mix for 2000 years. So literally we're baptized into Christ. We put on Christ in the baptism. Um, so then uh, the, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Okay, baptism. So baptism in the Syriac church is focused more on us being restored to what Adam lost, to his inheritance. Because St. Ephraim says things like, uh, he put Adam, Christ put Adam on and restored him back into paradise. So that is the goal in the Syriac mind. It's less concerned with this idea of original sin. I'm not saying that it doesn't exist. Clearly, Ihab is about to show us from St. Jacob of Suruj that, um, that we do have the concept, even St. Ephraim. So it's there. But maybe not this name, right? So uh, we'll talk about it soon. But uh, uh, this is, I think, the kind of, if someone were to look into Syriac, baptism in the Syriac tradition, this, is what, this would be the most prevalent theme in it. Makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So, and to me, I, I don't see why... Um, it's not a both and, right? Like, you know, the two sides that are discussing this, um, you, you know, the, to me, it, I, I've, I've always seen it reconcilable to where... I agree. You know, I, believe, I believe it's yeah. both. Yeah, yeah that, that makes... Because you have fathers who speak about <laughs> these things. Um, you know, you can't ignore half the fathers and go with the other half. Um, so, uh, I mean, so here's the, here's the Catholic view. And I, I say this because I, I want people to, to see both sides here. So the Catholic view is... Um, original sin is this adam and eve when they were created uh before the fall they were created in god's grace and god's friendship um and so they were uh, originally holy and originally just right what we call original holiness and original justice um you know they walked with god and all this everything was great right they had no suffering they had um no there's there no death um, and, and death is twofold, right? There's a, there's a death of the soul and there's a death of the body. The death of the body, obviously, is when you die. Death of the soul is a separation from the soul, uh, from God, right? God is separated from your soul, where before God is in there. So um, so th this is very patristic that the fathers spoke th this way, you know, death of the body. Death of the soul. And I'm talking about Greek fathers, not just, you know, Latin fathers. The, going back to um, uh, the Gregory of Nazianzen and, and and those people I've done a show on this if you want to go out and, and and take a look at the show I've done on the on original sin I go through the fathers Syriac actually I don't know if I I, I go through the Syriac fathers but we will today but I, I quote Latin fathers I quote Greek fathers and I even quote um, Eastern Orthodox saints like Pa like Gregory Palamas who's a also a saint in the Catholic Church now um, to show these uh, th this theme of the separation um of god and the soul that when you when you commit um when adam fell he did not only die a bodily death but he died a spiritual death his soul was dead right and so that's that's where that's where we come in and say so there's a there's a difference in the status of the person moral status where um before the fall adam and eve were friends with god and all that stuff and they had the holy spirit they had grace and they had all that stuff and everything was happy and then after the fall they lost those things right they got kicked out of paradise um and, and as you talked about it's it's like you're saying you know there's a difference between adding something and taking away something right mm -hmm. so those things were taken away from them right and when adam um Adam and Eve sinned, and now everyone that was born after them, or, or specifically conceived after them, we are conceived in a state of fallen, fallenness, right? Not because we've done anything wrong, but because our state is a state of death, which causes concupiscence, uh, which there's a state that's outside of grace, void of grace. And as uh, uh, St. Augustine would teach, he says that it's a state that's under the dominion of the devil, right? So that's how you're conceived. That's how you're born is under the devil, not under God. You're you're conceived under um, 
you're, you're void of grace rather than being graced. Um, you're not adopted son of God or daughter of God. You're lost and, and you're a child of wrath at St. Paul calls the, um, uh, the Christians, right? But he's talking about people that were sinning, but um, it would also apply to, uh, to, to infants that were just conceived that they're children of wrath because they're not under this, they're not under the status of being under this covenant, the new covenant of God, right? And so in order to become or to enter into that covenant, you have to be baptized, right? And so um, the question with the Immaculate Conception is, um, well, well, first of all, uh, if, I, if I can ask you, uh, Subdeacon, is what I've just described as far as status, the moral status, is, is that anywhere in the Syriac or the Oriental Orthodox tradition at all? I've have I've never seen it. Like Augustine's language is very um, strong, uh, and I haven't seen anything even close to this saying like under the dominion of the devil and and this kind of thing. I mean, I could see why he would logically go towards that, but I haven't seen it native to us. No. And, and I think the terminology is where there's a little bit of a turnoff, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but we're going to see with um, St. Uh, Jacob of Saru, he, he kind of is teaching the same thing, but he's not using language that strong, right? Because, you know, he brings in the serpent into it. He brings in grace. He brings in sonship and he brings in um, God and Holy Spirit where that was lost and Mary gains it back. Right. Where she she gets that back where um, where he's teaching that original sin is removed from her to restore her back to that humanity that humanity was meant to live in, to to to, to exist as. Um, so and, and if you don't mind um, and, and by the way, am I too loud because I can hear myself and I'm am I too loud or no? Not to me. Okay. I don't know. OK, I just want to make sure I'm not like popping people, people's ears. Um. You know, uh, we want to get into this this book here because this is um, it's called "On the Mother of God." It's homilies by Saint Jacob of Sarug, and I'm going to let uh, Subdeacon Daniel tell you guys a little bit about Saint Jacob. He's a he's a great and awesome saint. Yeah, so Saint Jacob, I always I'm a basketball fan, and if anybody knows anything about basketball, um, uh, Michael Jordan, the greatest of all time is St. Ephraim to the Syriacs, okay? And then St. Jacob tries his best to copy him in everything. So I like Kobe is like, tries really hard to copy Michael Jordan. Adam Hase to Kobe. Um, Jacob, St. Jacob is the Kobe, whereas Ephraim is the Jordan. So St. Jacob, he was a bishop. St. Ephraim was a deacon, okay? And uh, St. Jacob, um, he he's actually, he might be, the last great traditional Syriac father in the sense of traditional Syriac uh, uh, like uh, expression of faith comes down to us through poetry from the very first century, whether it's the Odes of Solomon or Cyrilona, Ephraim, Jacob. This is the typical way you see Syriac Christianity expressed. Less, it's less uh, you see kind of the formal apologetics in, in prose. That's, that's less common. Jacob might have been the last one to do that. And uh, uh, he, his poems are still used to this day, and you'll hear them every Sunday in the Syriac churches, Syriac Orthodox, the Syriac Catholic, and even Chaldeans use it, use him. Um, and there's a lot of sugiathe. Sugiathe are like dialogue poems back and forth that he writes of biblical stories that have happened. And he takes that from Ephraim too. So you'll see like maybe if you're Chaldean and you go to Mass on Easter, you'll see the Malach of Geyasa uh, play happening. Saint Ephraim, I think, wrote that one. But you'll, if tip, like there's other ones too. This is this one Saint Ephraim and Saint Jacob wrote some other ones. And if you have Narsai in your tradition, if you're Church of the East or Chaldean, he, I, he kind of is the Church of the East version, but Jacob is better. No offense. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would agree with that. Uh, I love Jacob, man. I, I mean, yeah. I read his writings um, on on Mother Mary, and it's so beautiful. I mean, if there's a word to describe the Syriac fathers, it's uh, their writing is beautiful, right? There's like it's just 
so poetic um and, and that's you know that's um what everyone says but you guys have to read these people to understand the the depth of the way they interpret the gospels they bring it to life it's like in your mind um, they make it into this movie where you can follow along this beautiful story and, and they're always taking from the old testament and bringing it to life in the new testament and i know a lot of fathers do that but the way the syriacs do it i think is just superior um, to the other fathers and um, one of my favorite fathers if not my favorite father of all time is saint ephraim mm -hmm. um you know he's he's always going to be um you know I, i'm a i was baptized confirmed syriac um so he's always going to be you know uh, special um for us even for uh subdeacon who was a syriac orthodox mm -hmm. um so i want to get into this um topic by reading saint jacob of Suru. um and this is his homily that he's writing on the descent of the holy spirit at the annunciation okay and it 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 might be you know it's about a two and a half pages i'm not going to read the whole thing but I, I do want to read some parts of it so he starts off and he says indeed the holy spirit came to mary to let loose from her the former sentence of eve and adam he sanctified her purified her and made her blessed among women. He freed her from that curse of suffering on account of Eve, her mother. She was summoned that she might be the mother of the son of God. The Holy spirit had sanctified her and so dwelt within her. The spirit freed her from that depth that she might be beyond transgression when he solemnly dwelt in her. Um, so already this language should start to sound a little bit uncomfortable um, for Catholics, right? Because he's talking about Mother Mary, where she's being freed from original sin at the Annunciation, right? That's what it sounds like on the surface. Um, and, and we'll get into that, and, and, and we'll talk about why I don't think that's what he's saying, because it wouldn't make sense in context if you read the whole homily, right? This is just the middle of the homily. He starts to get into it, but the context of it, if you were to read it that way, it'd be like, okay, you're contradicting yourself. You're not making any sense, right? So, and we'll get into that. But the, the purpose of this, uh, the reason why I want to read this is because I, I want people to see, um, you know, what St. Jacob taught on original sin. And again, my goal here is to show similarities, not just differences. And and I want to show the similarities between our traditions. Maybe we don't use the same, same words, but it, it's very close to the same teaching so he says you know um he says um the son of man while not being subject to judgment he himself god goes out into the world from the daughter of man on this account that holy one of renown um and most blessed one the pure virgin he sanctified with the spirit he made her pure limpid and blessed as that eve before the serpent spoke with her so you see this theme uh he made her this way the way Eve was before the serpent spoke with her. So he has this idea of before the fall, what your status is, and after the fall, what your status is. And then here's the key. He says, he bestowed on her that first grace which her mother had until she ate from the tree which was full of death. So he's talking about Mother Mary receiving that grace. Um, and, and this is what I was talking about um, the Western idea of original sin is where you're void of grace when you're conceived. And then when you're, um, when you're baptized, you receive that grace back. Right. And we believe that Mary had that was full of grace from conception. Right. And we'll, and we'll get into that as well. And then he says, the spirit who came made her like Eve of old, though she did not hear the counsel of the serpent nor his hateful speech. And then notice where he says here, he says, in that condition, that condition where Eve and Adam were placed before they sinned, he placed her and then descended in her. Okay, so this is this is very important. You know, he's talking about the way Eve was before the fall and after the fall. And he's saying Mother Mary is being made like Eve before the fall, which now tells you there's a difference. And now the question is, what is the difference, right? And here's the, the key here. He says that adoption of sons, which our father Adam had, he gave to Mary by the Holy Spirit while dwelling in her. And there, there's the idea that in the beginning of the show, I talked about where we were not adopted sons of God. When we're conceived, we are under the dominion of the devil. 
And he's saying this in so many words, but not using that type of like angry, strong, you know, kind of like uh, judicial, like, you know, hammer down language that St. Augustine would use. He's he's doing it in a more beautiful and poetic way. Right. Um, and, and maybe that's the preferred way for a lot of people. Um, and then um, he says the Holy Spirit, which had blown on Adam's face and generated Eve, she also received and gave birth to a son. And there is the theme of her receiving the Holy Spirit um, to where we believe that when all of us are conceived, we're conceived without the Holy Spirit being living without the Holy Spirit living in us, uh, where we need to be baptized in order to receive the Holy Spirit and God in us. Um, the purity, that purity, which was in Adam, Mary also acquired by the spirit who came and she gave birth without impulse of lust. Um, so, um, and then he says here, and this is the, uh, this is a key here. He says this, he sanctified her body and made her without hateful lusts as the virgin Eve had been until she lusted. Notice here, you know, if you were going to take him literally, um, he's saying that he sanctified her body. You know, uh, the Holy Spirit sanctified her uh, Mother Mary's body and made her without hateful lusts. Now, is he saying that prior to the sanctification, Mary had hateful lusts? And then he says, as the virgin Eve had been until she lusted. And then he says, the sin which entered Adam's race with impulse of desire, the Holy Spirit cast out from her when he came within her. And he says, that increase of evil inclination which the serpent affected, he wiped from her and filled her with holiness and integrity. So basically what he's saying is, what he's saying is um, concupiscence was removed from Mother Mary, supposedly at the, at, at the Annunciation. So is he saying that prior to the Annunciation, Mother Mary had concupiscence? Is he saying that she had lust? You know, these are things that are uncomfortable for us to read if we're going to take him for his word. But I, I don't think that's what he's saying. Um and and uh, before I get into into that, what are your your thoughts uh, on, on this subdeacon? Yeah, I don't I don't think we believe that she had lustful thoughts or anything like that too. Um, that's I wouldn't I would be surprised if any of us interpreted Jacob that way. <clears throat> yes, and and you know we don't have to even you you don't even have to like play gymnast mental gymnastics with it to to try to get out of that. You know, we're not trying to get away from like this this web that we're tangled into. It's it's really not that. Um, the reason why I say this is once we start getting into it more, it's going to make a lot of sense as to what he's saying. You know, um, but on the surface, it does sound uncomfortable for all of our traditions. Not just it's not just for people who believe in the Immaculate Conception uh, like the Catholics do, but it's uncomfortable language on the surface for you know any tradition to think that Mother Mary's lustful desires or concupiscence was all was removed from the Annunciation. We don't believe that she even had that ever at, at any moment of her life. Um, so here's here's what he says. Um, <clears throat> he says, for if Mary had, uh, had had not had sublime impulses, she would not have arrived to speak before the watcher. He says, and here's the key. He says, if she, um, he says, she rose up to this measure on her own. She rose up to this measure on her own until the spirit, that perfecter of all, came to her. She was full of grace from God, which was more exalted than all. The only begotten dwelt in her womb to renew all. Now, the key is, he says, she rose up to this measure on her own. That's a, the, So he's saying all these things that were removed from her, all these negative things, and she was given all these positive things. He's saying that from the beginning of her existence, she had those things and she was acquiring those things uh, as, as her life progressed at every moment of her life. And I'm not just making that up. Uh, this is literally what the homily is about. If you read the before um, uh, where he talks about, you know, uh, from from the beginning, her nature was perfect or was pure. You know, he, he's, he's talking about how this woman had no impulse or desires. He says that he says she had no concupiscence. Before the Annunciation, he's saying this about her. He's saying from when she was a child, she never had any any like evil thought, any lustful thoughts. And here he's saying it was removed from her. And what I think um, he's saying is, so there, there's an essay, um, and, and I, I, I want to see if I can find it. There's an essay written um, by all people, a, <clears throat> a Protestant 
about uh, St. Jacob of Sarug on this very topic, the, on this very um, homily that we just read. Um, so uh, let me see. Here it is. Okay. So this is very important because it's uh, she doesn't have a dog in this fight, right? And that's why I, I, I like to... Um, uh, to read this here, this is, and I'll tell you who it is, but I, I want to go ahead and read it first. He says, um, Jacob then pursues the idea of Mary exercising her free will to grow in virtue. And this is what Jacob says. He says, this is beauty. When one is beautiful of one's own accord, glorious graces of perfection are in her will. However great be the beauty of something from God, is it is not acclaimed if freedom is not present, even God loves beauty, which is from the will. She drew near to the limit of virtue by her soul, so that grace, which is without limit, dwelt in her, even though Mary is pleasing as much as it is given nature. So, um, and then he says, uh, her, and this is this is St. Jacob speaking here in the same homily. He says, her, her original nature, her original nature, which, you know, from the beginning, uh, was preserved with a will of for good things. From which, from when she knew to distinguish good from evil, she stood firm in purity of heart and in integrity of thoughts. From childhood, impulses of holiness stricted within, stirred within her, and in her excellence, she increased them with great care. So it's obviously not, he's not saying, you know, all of a sudden these things were removed from her at the Annunciation because, and, and I can go on and on about this because he says so many other beautiful things about her from childhood and prior to the Annunciation. Um, and so, and here's what I believe, and, and I'll let you uh, comment on this. And, and I know a lot of people will, will say this about the Syriac fathers. Will say, okay, look, um, Saint Ephraim did say that um, that Saint that Saint Mary was the uh, that you alone, you know, Jesus, you and Mary, you alone are uh, pure and holy, right? Mm -hmm. um, right. He says these things, and, and people will be like, yeah, but you know what? Who who knows at what point? He's saying she was holy. Maybe at the Annunciation is where her holiness began. And then from then on, that's why he's saying she's holy, because there was a point where she became that. I don't think that's what he's saying. Right. And the reason why is because, as you described with Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan, it's the tradition that they pass on. Uh, St. Jacob is saying that she was holy from the beginning. She was pure from the beginning. Her nature was perfect from the beginning. Right. And, and, and so that's why they're able to call her pure, perfectly pure, uh, in the same sentence they call Jesus pure, right? They, they say that about Mother Mary. Um, so what I think is happening is this, and, and this, is, this does not contradict the Immaculate Conception. Here's what's happening. What's happening is um, Mother Mary, from conception all the way to death, is increasing in holiness. And we believe the same thing as Catholics. We don't think that, you know, her, her, her holiness was given to her at the conception of, of, uh, of her life from the beginning of her life. And then all of a sudden she did not even need any more grace. She, she did not need to grow in holiness anymore. That's it. She was perfected at that time. That's not what we believe. We believe that holiness is not something that stops happening. It's a continuous thing, right? So she kept uh, grow. She, she grew in holiness. And, and then we say, especially at the Annunciation, that was like, that was like, you know, you're about to receive the son of God. Right. Even the catechism says that her womb was purified. Catechism of the Catholic Church says her womb was purified. So we have this understanding of purification that wow. happens at the Annunciation. Yeah. And so um, the idea is that she was being purified in order to um, to have the Son of God enter in her so that he has a uh, um, so he doesn't take on this um, this. Uh, I guess, dirty nature in a sense. Right. It's pure. Right. But he, it's still our nature. He's still taking on our nature. Um, and so just to summarize, I, and then I, I want to get your thoughts on it too, is what I think is happening is we're talking past each other because as I was talking with the father, he, he kind of thought that immaculate conception means like, you know, she was conceived immaculately and that's it. That's she's perfect. She doesn't need anything, any, any growth and holiness. Um, but she did, she did grow in holiness because holiness doesn't stop. And then at the Annunciation, especially, she grew in the most holiness where she um, she almost, um, and, and this is how I like to, to, to explain it, is picture a beautiful room that is absolutely clean, right? And at the Annunciation, when she's being purified, 
it's not that that room needs to be cleaned. It's that you put a, f a flower vase in the room to make it more beautiful, right? And that's that's what we believe the enunciation is happening. It's not something that was um, dirty and then she was cleansed of it. You know, it's not like that. But uh, what are your thoughts on this? I'm, I know I'm talking so much. No, no, it's okay. Uh, I just kind of want to um, make sure I'm understanding. So like the increase in holiness, I think everyone's on the same page with that. For... The purification, which we believe is at the Annunciation, is her baptism. And you said the Catholics even agree with this. What is she being purified from? At the uh, at the Annunciation? Yeah. So like when the Catechism says uh, that she's pure, that she's her womb is being purified? Yeah. Um, so that that's, uh, to me, that that's always been a, a mystery. Um, I, I can I can only say that... Um, the, the purification of the womb is to prepare the son of God to enter that womb. And so, you know, obviously the, the womb is something that um, Eve had tarnished, right. Uh, in her fall. Um, and it, it's a language where it's going back to Genesis where Eve tarnishes and, and, and makes the womb dirty in a sense. Um, and then, so it's being purified. So it's not like a moral purification. It's not a, it's not a something that she's missing. And then here she is, and she gains it back in a sense, right? Um, it, it's 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 going back to um, to Eve. Um, it's 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 almost like a Christ-centered passage, uh, if I want to call it a passage. It's a Christ-centered um, uh, paragraph in the cat in the Catechism where it, it, it the the womb needs to be pure in order for him to enter in in that in that womb. So I'm just thinking out loud with you. If we like. If we say, so Eve, before the fall, Eve was tempted, correct? And she was, uh, and I guess you could say it was for sure external, but perhaps internal to the, like, in that she she fell to the temptation. So there had to have been some internal cooperation, just like Eve, Mary did the opposite. Mary internally cooperated with, with grace instead of Eve cooperating with the devil, right? Um. So in this, what's up, Enoch? Long time, bro. Um, in this, uh, Mary, before the Annunciation, can we say, has this kind of option within her that Eve also had, but Eve fell, whereas Mary did not. Mary, Mary restored Eve. Uh, by her own free will, right? So then at the Annunciation, it's like like Sebastian Brock is saying she like received the primordial robe that we're going to eventually get later, right? Like she has the prototype of it. So at the Annunciation, she kind of passed the test that Eve failed, that if Eve succeeded, she would have been able to eat from the tree of life. Whereas Mary passed this, so now it's like the stamp. Like she she did it, you know. But it, the purification is of that thing that is like kind of the 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 balance, the the, the questioning of like, okay, am I going to cooperate with this or am I going to cooperate with that? So the annunciation is her passing of that test, kind of thing, and that's what she's purified from, what she had before. I don't know. I'm thinking out loud with you. Yeah, and, and and it sounds like it would be more than what we receive at baptism, right? Because yeah, it's, it's sure. like what what we receive in the uh, what the is resurrection, it? the resurrection, right? Yeah. That's what she's getting at the at the uh, at the Annunciation, mm -hmm. um, according to the Syriac fathers, right? And it's like, you know, it, she's she's not this ordinary woman that is following um, the footsteps that we follow in the sense that there's something special about her, right? Um, and 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 I, I want to touch up on that because there's a, there's a question of why the Immaculate Conception, right? The Immaculate, like, why do we need the Immaculate Conception? Um, the, the reason um, that I think, well, the, that's the, the, the church answers the question as to why the Immaculate Conception is why are these gifts given to her? It's simple. It's, it's a simple answer. It's for her to carry out the role of divine maternity, right? It's so... Um, in order to carry out the, the role of divine maternity, you have to say yes to the angel, correct? Right? To say yes to the angel when Gabriel said, you know, you will conceive the son of God. And she says, let this be done to me according to your word. Um, now you go back to Eve where 
she did not have concupiscence and as you touched upon it she was she still fell she was deceived into it right she mm -hmm. so she fell um because she wasn't being prudent right she wasn't questioning the the, the, the serpent she was um you know uh she did not question him imprudently where this is why in the gospel of luke mother mary asked the question how could this be if i know not man the reason why St. Luke is writing this is he's showing you, look, there's the old Eve, the first Eve, and the second Eve. Look at the difference where this woman is being prudent. She's not assuming this angel is a good angel. She doesn't know yet. So he's like, hey, uh, I'm a consecrated virgin. I'm not, I'm, I'm, my whole life, I'm not supposed to have any relations with man. How can you tell me right now I'm supposed to get pregnant? That doesn't make any sense. How could this be? You tell me, how is this possible? So she's being prudent. That's why she's asking the question, right? And, and going back to Immaculate Conception, so she is, uh, she is she doesn't have concupiscence. She has that gift of having this, um, uh, of, of not having a pull towards sin like we do, right? In order for her at that moment at the Annunciation to say yes to the angel. So that gift was given to her, right? That gift was not given to her because of the Immaculate Conception. That's not where the direct gift comes from. That gift was given to her because she is to become the mother of God. A lot of people misunderstand that. They think that, oh, immaculate conception means you have no original sin, which means you don't have concupiscence. But that's not where it's coming from. Indirectly, it's coming there from there, but directly it's coming because her role is divine maternity. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. So would you say that because she was predestined to be the mother of God and because of that, she at no point in her existence would have been damned? You know, she would all always been saved, no matter what. Uh, but at the same time, she has free will, uh, and she's not impeccable, right? So she would have. I I, I still think um, that if you remember from the intro to the book that you were just reading from, uh, where Brock is saying, uh, he's saying that the the Syriac tradition holds to a dynamic view rather than a static view, and that Mary overcame a disadvantage that Eve did not overcome. So she started off at a lesser point. All that into account, Mary predestined to this role, like you're saying, in the Syriac mindset and, and system. Is that efficient Mariology? Is that sufficient Mariology? Is that sufficient Mariology to believe while having like a non applicable stance towards the papal definition of the Immaculate Conception? So the the part where you, it's interesting, you say the predestination of Mary, where she was predestined to be the mother of God, that is so um, tied to the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. That is so right. tied to it. It's, that's it's why I'm like, asking. Yeah, yeah you, you can't have it without that because that's the first thing that people need to really study is the predestination of the mother of God in order to understand the Immaculate Conception. Because as we know, it's from Genesis, uh, she's being prophesied that she's going to be an enmity between uh, between you and the woman, uh, between the serpent, right? She's gonna she's gonna be she's gonna have enmity between herself and the serpent. So yes, uh, the predestination of Mary is a very important part of Immaculate Conception. It's a very important part of her role as divine maternity. Mm. And I'm glad you touched on that because um, and this is why we believe she was created in this state that, that you're describing, right? We agree. So um, and and we would say that. When we are conceived, we are conceived not having the Holy Spirit in us. We were conceived without having grace. When she was conceived, um, she was conceived in grace, and she was conceived with the Holy Spirit. So there was not a moment in her life where she ever had a separation from God. She always had God in her and with her. She always had grace. That's why she say she, she's full of grace. She's full of grace. So she always had those things from every moment of her life. Not only did she have grace, but she increased in holiness throughout her whole life, right? So, and, and, and these are gifts that are given to her in order for her to carry out the divine maternity. And I want to talk about this. Um, she, she was not given the gift of not dying, right? She died, right? And this, most Catholic theologians will, will say that she did die, right? Mm -hmm. I, I believe she died. And she was not given that because that gift is not something that you need in order to carry out your role as divine maternity, right? But th th there's a difference in why she died versus why we die. 
We, we die as a punishment to sin. She did not die as a punishment to sin. She died to imitate her son, right? Um, so, so there's that. Number two, she still suffered on earth, even though Adam and Eve did not suffer. So she did not receive these temporal, um, temporal uh, gifts of like, you know, bodily things where like you don't get sick, you don't suffer. Yeah. She got sick. She suffered. She died. These things, you don't need these things to carry out your role as divine maternity. You need the spiritual things to carry out that role, right? So the, the that's what she was given. Her moral status was that she was always in friendship with God. She was the adopted daughter of God at all times. Um, and, and so that's an important distinction to make um, it, because a lot of times this is where I think we're talking past each other when we say she did not have the stain of original sin. That's what we say in the dogma. And then the, to the Orthodox, what that sounds like is, oh, so she, she didn't suffer, you know, she didn't die. Like, what do you mean she didn't have the stain of original sin? What is the stain? The stain of original sin is the status that you're given when you are conceived. Our status is different than hers, right? Um, any thoughts on that? So deep yeah, so, bro, like you and I have been talking about this for years. And I like it's gotten to the point where we are looking for where the disagreement is, you know, um, because... Like you, we were talking, me and you were talking about the, the 2025 show that I had previously done. And you're like, there was me and EO and Catholic and Syrian Church of the East. And we all agreed on, on the thing. And I'm like, is that something that you could agree on? And you're like, yeah, that's what we believe anyway. So um, I'm not, I'm not sure if um, there's for sure talking past each other. There's for sure not thinking things through enough maybe on both sides maybe maybe both sides try to impose um their premise and their uh world like patristic worldview onto the other side you know what i mean so it's like i think if you're a, if you're a traditional latin in the sense i'm not talking about like tlm traditional latin i just mean like a western catholic roman catholic and you don't know about eastern christianity so you're coming, you're telling us you guys have to accept the Immaculate Conception and like one, two, three, Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, etc. You know, and then here we are being like, we don't speak. We don't even know what you're saying. We need Google Translate, you know, and then like we're telling him about Ephraim. He's like, who's Ephraim? Was he Jewish? And we're like, no, Ephraim the Syrian. And it's like this whole different world coming into the conversation. And we're trying to understand each other. So. It's like there needs to be uh, there needs to be room for having diversity in thought and in uh, in expression while I mean, ultimately in communion. But in the meantime, like moving past the point, at least to, yes. to say, OK, we're actually maybe agreeing and we, we just we're talking about it in different ways. Just like how purification after death, the show me and you and William did before. Like, I'm not, I didn't use the word purgatory one time, you know, but what I said, you guys agreed to everything I was saying. Yes. Yeah. And that, this is where I always, I'm always coming from, right? I'm always like, hey, you know, we're saying the same things, right? Because this is the question that I always ask people hey, uh, when we're conceived, are we conceived with grace and with the Holy Spirit? No. We're not. We all agree, right? We're not. We we are we're conceived in need of something, in need of God and grace in our lives, right? And that's where baptism happens. Now you ask the question about the mother of God. Hey, is was she conceived with grace and with the Holy Spirit in her? If you say no, then what you're saying is she was um, you know, she was conceived not under God, but whatever you want to call it, child of wrath, dominion of the devil, whatever you want to call it, but it's not under God. If it's not under God, then it's not good, right? There's something missing there. Um, and, and I think there is, in the Catholic Church, where we, we call this thing called the sensus fidelium, where you have the sense of the faith, where it was something feels off, right? It, it feels off to say that the mother of God was not in the friendship with God throughout her whole existence. But it feels off, like you're, you're uncomfortable saying that. She was under the dominion of the devil, like Mary under the dominion of the devil, really? Like that's what you're going to say, right? Yeah. Nobody says these things because it's uncomfortable for us to say these things. It's imprudent. Um, it's it's irreverent. Uh, it's, it's not something you want to talk about the mother of God that way. And I think there's a reason why we have that in us, where we, we, we don't want to talk about her. 
that way. Not not just in in a dogmatic sense, but just in you know spiritual sense, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. it's similar. I think there's a lot of things that it's like we we look to fight and we don't need to. This is one of them. And then uh, uh, another one, maybe inshallah, in the future, me and you will can do like a Peter show. Um, because P Peter's place is so high in the Syriac tradition, you know, how can you be out of communion with Peter and be right? You can't. Right. Yeah, that's a good. That would be a fun show to do. That's a yeah. good idea. Yeah. Um, I, I read this on Saturday with Father. Are you familiar with Ludwig van Ott, Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma? No. So he's a theologian who wrote this book on the teachings of the Catholic Church. Uh, and I forgot how many, uh, like 100 or 200 years ago. I can't remember how, how long ago. But he's 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 a huge theologian, and this is like a uh, a book that Catholics go to to see, like, what do we believe? Um, like, you know, what are we're specifically on things that it's not just like general teachings, but it goes into specifics. So, this is what he says about the Mother of God. He says, um, while Christ's fullness of grace was perfect from the beginning, the Mother of God increased in grace and holiness up to her death. And 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 the, I want to say this because for a, a lot of people watching, they they'll be like, might be skeptical. It's like, oh no, you guys believe Mother Mary was perfect from conception, and she did not eat anything after that. Um, that's not what we teach. And and um, and then another thing I mentioned earlier, and I'm just trying to sort of prove the points that I've made, where it's not just coming from Elijah Yassi. Like, who's Elijah Yassi? Who cares what you have to say? Um, <laughs> here's here's another one where he he talks about the spiritual and the temporal punishments, where he says. Freedom from original sin does not necessarily involve freedom from all defects which came into the world as a punishment for sin. Mary, like Christ himself, was subject to the general human defects insofar as these involve no moral imperfections, right? So it's the temporal things that she suffered from. So in the sense, in that sense, like the East would say, well, that's original sin, right? So yeah, she had original sin because she suffered from these things. That's where we're talking past each other, in my opinion. But then when you ask the question, what was her moral status from conception? And you say, well, her moral status is so then you would so then it's it's the talking the talking past is happening by both sides. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And 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 uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because when I did my two part series on the Immaculate Conception and Original Sin, those are the first two shows I did, I think, on my show. Part one, part two, original sin and, and immaculate conception. For the whole two shows, the whole two shows, I was trying to prove the point that we're both emphasizing two different things, and that's how we're talking past each other. That's how we're talking past. I'm not. I wasn't trying to disprove Eastern Orthodoxy. I was trying to show that, or Oriental Orthodoxy, or whatever Orthodoxy. I was trying to show that um, this this is a talking past each other where we're we're. We're talking about spiritual things. That's what she was given. But we're not yeah. talking about temporal things. And then when you say, oh, no, she had original sin, you're emphasizing the temporal things, which we agree with, right? So for the for the sake of the viewer, whether he's Orthodox, Oriental, Assyrian, Catholic, please just clarify what the Catholic talking past coming is and then what the Orthodox emphasizing part of talking past because like you said exactly we're emphasizing two different points we're saying them as if they're responses to what the other one is saying but they're actually two different points that we're talking about yes so uh, the East whether it's Oriental or Eastern Orthodox they, they emphasize um, original sin is death which is a temporal punishment um, it, suffering um, sweat and labor uh, sickness hunger, things like that. Like these are things that original sin caused, the temporal. And, and that's the emphasis from the East. They don't deny the spiritual ones that the West emphasizes. The West is emphasizing your status, the moral status when you're conceived. Are you conceived under God or under the devil? Are you conceived with grace or void of grace? Are you conceived with concupiscence or no concupiscence, right? These are things that uh, that, that West is emphasizing when it comes to the immaculate conception and original sin. And so we're answering the question of the spiritual, but we're not saying anything about the temporal. We're not saying that she had those things. She had those gifts, right? Um, and, and this has been my mission in, in, in trying to show people that, look, we're, we're, we're not different here. Even, um, even uh, Father John Ramsey, when he was on, I wasn't trying to disprove his points. I, I was trying to show, hey, we're saying the same thing. You know, what you're saying sounds a lot like what I believe. Um, so, so would you say... Then what the East is saying that she had 
This is what she was purified from at the Annunciation. What the, can you say that again and more specifically what she had is as far as what? So all the temporal things that you listed. Um, or the the uh, like being open to sickness and death and oh, mortality um, and, and all of these things. Do, or do you think that this is what that these causes are results of original sin? Because not the moral status, but everything else that comes to or, with original sin that Mary did have that um, was part of her fallen humanity in the in the natural sense, right? Yes, um, I, I think. I think there is a little bit of that where you can say say it, but like you have to be careful because um, it's not like after the Annunciation she didn't get sick. You know, mm -hmm. it's not like after that she didn't die or or she didn't suffer. Got it. You know, so y y there there is a certain truth to that. There's a purification of 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 um, m maybe in the in the Syriac fathers they they would use that kind of language that you're saying, um, but at the same time, you know. It also sounds like they're emphasizing the spiritual as well as as we we read from Saint Jacob uh, as far as uh, Mother Mary. Um, so I, I would be careful to answer that as a yes. I would I would say probably more no than a yes. But I actually used to think that. It's funny you say that. I used to think that, but then I thought about it. I was like, that doesn't make any sense, right? Um, but there is a little bit of truth to it. It's not absolute no. Sorry. So. Uh, you answered this question already, but just because we're talking about it again, what what did you say that she was purified from them in the in the Annunciation? Uh, at the Annunciation, so when we say purified, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that um, Father Capus and William Albrecht have done a lot of good work in, yeah. as far as you know, the, what what does the purification mean in the, in the in the West or in the Catholic Church? Um, we would say it's an increase of holiness. Where she's being poured this grace in her, where she's being prepared to to receive the Son of God. Because I always say this, I say this, I say, I don't care how pure you are, I don't care how holy you are. Mm -hmm. If you're about to receive God incarnate in your womb, you best be purified. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Like, well, like whatever we don't, it, the, you're saying that it doesn't need to be defined of what she was purified from. Well, so it, it's not a purified from. It's a okay. it's a it's a purification of right? right. So it's not like you're removing something that's that's dirty from her. It's you're adding beauty to her. So gotcha. just like I said, the, the the room that's beautiful, it's clean. You, you so clean it's a gaining, room. not a losing. Exactly. It's like yeah, what the Syriac tradition emphasizes, anyway. Yeah. It, exactly. Yeah. yeah. That it's a it's a it's a gaining, not losing. That's a great way to put it. Okay. Um, so she, yeah, she is gaining something. <clears throat> um, and and by the way, if you guys have questions, uh, please post them. I did see a couple of questions um, above, but um, and, and I, if you don't mind, Subdeacon, I, I do want to take one from a good friend of mine. His name Go is uh, Glenn Guadalupe. Um, he says, important question, uh, were Adam and Eve naturally immortal or were they immortal by grace? I think the answer is still in the realm of theological inquiry. Um, what would you say about that? No, it's by grace. It's already been defined, this this question. Uh, in the 6th century, the the dialogue between um, St. Se Severus the Great of Antioch, crown of the Syrians, uh, versus Julian the heretic, even it, there, this was during all the Chalcedonian controversy. The Chalcedonians agreed with Severus. Um, all the, the churches who accepted Chalcedon agreed with Severus on this point, that it is by grace that they were immortal. Uh, St. Ephraim talks about, he says, Adam and Eve, when they were created, they were created in a neutral, a neutral state. Um, and had they passed the test, they would have received uh, immortality. But in the meantime, they were immortal by grace, not by nature. I would agree with that, yeah. And, and this is another, uh, another reason why I don't think the Immaculate Conception question only applies to the West, because this is where we, we talk about grace, where they had the original grace to have these gifts. And then that grace was removed from humanity. But was that grace given back to Mother Mary at the at the uh, conception or not? That's the question that the original sin, I'm um, sorry, the Immaculate Conception is, is answering. Um, and if you guys have any questions, um, please feel free to post them um, as, as we go through the discussion. Um, uh, Subdeacon, any any final thoughts or anything, any questions or anything like that? 
Uh, thank you always, Ihab, for everything, all of our conversations from 12 years ago to this day, and inshallah in the future. Uh, we're gonna. I know this is not it. Like we're gonna be talking about the same subject by five years from now, probably. Um, it's never gonna end. So, the more the more we look into it, the more we understand these things. I think uh, I, you're gonna come on my show soon. What is it? Twenty second, twenty fourth. Yeah, somewhere uh, around there. And, and yeah. what, what what are we gonna talk about? Tell the audience. I, th I think I think you wanted to do Jacob and Mary, right? Again, what was I, it? Was I thought it was original sin, but I could be oh, wrong. My bad. Yeah, yeah. Jacob and original sin. Or was okay. it J Jacob has something to do with it or no? Yes. So what we're doing is we're doing a 12 part series on St. Jacob, right? Okay. Yeah, so right. we're doing um, every month, January all the way to December, we're to picking a topic and, and we're, we're going into it um, as far as sub, um, what St. Jacob believed, right? So the first one, we thought we would start with original sin since that was like the very beginning. And then we move our way through. Uh, we talk about his his idea of Christology, and then oh, we'll talk about Mother Mary, and um, talk about oh, what Christ did on the cross for us. Um, th these are the things that. Um, which, by the way, um, I, I, before I forget, I, I did want to mention that point. Um, talk about this, uh, Subdeacon, as far as the theology of the Syriac fathers mm -hmm. and their idea of when Adam and Eve fell, um, there was a debt that humanity has to pay back to God. Is that, I know that's a Western idea, but is that also a Syriac idea where it was paid on the cross? Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't know anything about the whole uh, debate that happens online, the penal substitution, all that stuff. I don't, I don't know anything about it, but I'm telling you just from a Syriac Christian who's, you know, paying attention during liturgy and hymns and stuff like that. We mentioned that type of language all the time. God's wrath and and Christ paid the debt and penal so like the, we don't say the word penal substitution but I mean it's I, I think that um, that language is there that that what you're what you're implying is there yes yeah. and and I think it's there all over the place and I and I can't wait to do that show um, on the Syriac Father um, Saint Jacob to where we're going to show and, and this this actually touches upon the topic we're talking about today. Uh, and I'm sorry, I still have this question up. Um, there we go. Um, where we talk about, look, Adam and Eve, when they fell, uh, they had a debt to pay back to God, right? That's the original sin. Uh, when Christ dies on the cross, he pays back that debt, right? He pays back that debt. He rises. He, he, he defeats death by death. Um, that's in the Western Fathers, and that's in the Syriac Fathers everywhere. That's in St. Ephraim. That's in St. Jacob. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll get into that um, when we uh, we do that show. Um, here's another uh, question. Um, MK Vine, is immortality a preternatural gift? Um, I don't know what preternatural means. Uh, but like, I, okay, so it's Adam and Eve before the fall were immortal by grace. If they passed, they would have God would have allowed them to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and he would have allowed them to eat from the tree of life. And if they had eaten from the tree of life, they would have lived forever. Um, but originally they were immortal just by grace, not not by nature. I don't know if that answers the question. I don't know what prayer. Yeah. Okay. No, that that's an excellent question. I, I, I do go into this. Uh I've done a show and and um you'll have to forgive me, uh MK Vine. So uh, as a subdeacon knows, I Actually, I, I got um, COVID in, I think it was November of 2021. I can't remember. I think, yeah, 2021. And this is the point I'm about to make. I, there's, you know, um, when I got COVID, I, I had like uh, this, it had an effect on me as far as my, my, my brain. So I, I lost a lot of memory, uh, uh, brain fog, and it's shown that it does do that to some people. Um, and so a lot of these things um, that I knew theologically, I don't want to answer the question in, without looking into it and going back and, and seeing what the answer is because I don't remember. Um, but I did a show on this where I answered that question specifically. So if you go back and watch that show on Original Sin, I do answer that. Um, if, if immortality was a preternatural gift or not. Um, I want to say yes, but don't quote me on that. Um, just like Subdeacon is saying. Now, there is a, let's see here. Uh, I thought I saw another question. Oh, here's a good question by a good friend of mine. His name is uh, Sermed. And he said, 
Does Subdeacon find it problematic that Rome made the Immaculate Conception a dogmatic expression of faith? I do, because of the the papacy that we are we have a disagreement on how that works. So uh, I would have liked, ideally, in in a in a, a world where all the apostolic churches were united, that they would have had an ecumenical council if it was such a big dogmatic question about it. Yeah. And then we have a, a question from. Um, Bao Duong, which is a question for you, Subdeacon. Uh, are there recommended sources to read the Syriac Fathers? Yeah, so every student of Syriac Christianity, I always recommend two books. These are the two books to start with, and then you can go whichever route you want after, in my opinion. Uh, the first one is by Dr. Sebastian Brock, The Luminous Eye. And the second one is by Roman Catholic priest, uh, late, uh, uh, the late great father uh, Robert Murray. Um and it's called Symbols of Church and Kingdom. These two books, I think they are the keys to, to this, the Syriac tradition as translated into English. Fantastic. And, and uh, we, we've done shows with uh, Dr. Brock mm -hmm. before. Uh, I, think are two, I think there's two shows uh, there on YouTube um, with William Albrecht. And those are one of the, one of the more fun shows that we've done. Um, Here's another question for you, uh, Subdeacon. Uh, Deacon Daniel Kakish, have you read St. Ephraim's commentary on the third epistle of Paul to the Corinthians? No, I'm super interested. I didn't even know that was out in English. That's available. The third epistle, bad. I had no idea. The third epistle to the to Corinthians. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, that I mean, if you uh, and by the way, uh, Put a plug in, Subdeacon. What is you have a YouTube channel, right? I want you to talk. Yeah. About uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, it's, uh, it's called the Lion's Den. There's a corresponding, um, uh, there's a corresponding Discord uh, server to it. And uh, please catch me. Like Elijah said, we're gonna have a series of shows on there about uh, Saint Jacob on various topics. Me and Elijah, uh, I think every month, um, starting with original sin, like he said. And, um, yeah, I mean, I want to get it kind of more active. So please check it out. Subscribe. Uh, I'd like to get the numbers up. I usually the, the numbers pick up after the record, after the live is on there. But I would like to get it more while we're on. That would be cool to get questions and stuff. Um, at Take Back Constantinople, I do read Syriac. But I didn't know that. I thought you meant like it was like published into English or something. Um, yeah. Sweet. And then, um, yeah, th that he clarified, he, he's talking about the, the original language. Um, and then we have a, a question from um, Thomas. He says, mm -hmm. uh, from the Roman Catholic perspective, <clears throat> uh, why is it wrong for St. Mary to have had concupiscence until the Annunciation, since she would have gone to Abraham's bosom with or without it at that time, like Christ, um, Christ's passion? So, um, I, I, it's not about whether it was wrong or not. Uh, and I think, uh, there, there is a, a little bit of a nuance in this question and the answer, right? Because one can have concupiscence, but never have felt any pull to sin, right? That means like you were given grace. It's not something that's given to you, um, like as a gift from conception internally, where it's like, okay, yes, you don't have concupiscence, just like Adam and Eve didn't have concupiscence. But you could have concupiscence in the way that we have concupiscence, but you just never have temptations because you're just that holy, right? Um, and so, and, and it's funny because St. Thomas Aquinas believed that concupiscence was wiped away from Mother Mary completely at the Annunciation. But it's not like he's saying that before that she had lustful thoughts and things like that, God forbid, right? He, he would still say that, and he does say that she had perfect... Um, holiness and never had any like not even one second of temptation where she's like oh maybe i should nope no not even one second it was all holiness right so regardless of whether you have concupiscence or not we all agree that she did not feel any temptations right and i would hope that that you would agree with that um but the, to answer the question i think that um you know uh like i said if, if you if you read this homily on the in this book he goes through from her childhood where he says that she did not have concupiscence, right? So it's not like 
This is something that we have to teach. It's just, that's what the fathers teach, right? She didn't have concupiscence. Now, did the fathers teach that she didn't have concupiscence because of a gift that they were given to her? No, they don't get into that. So you speculate, is it because she has given grace or is it twofold? Maybe it's both. And, you know, these are things that we talk about theologically, but there's no definitive answer from this, from any of our churches, right? There's no nothing to find. So, um, and, and, you know, that's how I would answer the question. I think there's more popping up here. So let's see here. Um, said, uh, okay, Shlama Lama, <laughs> red pajama. Unsure if this has already been said, but what is the OO position on the salvation outside of Oriental Orthodox Church for Apostolic Christians, Protestants, and non Christians? Yeah, I think, uh, it's, I'm, I mean, I don't know if Shlama Lama is, is Chaldean, just from the name, I'm guessing, but it's it would be the same, I would say, similar ecclesiology, at least. We would say there's no salvation ordinarily outside of the, the one Catholic church, which is, as you call it, Oriental Orthodoxy. Um, but obviously, there, God, like, there's no, uh, God's not limited by anything, and people could be united to it without even knowing that they are but the ordinary ways to be in communion with the church. Sounds good. Perfect. And then here's uh, Thomas again. He says, um, so then I think the general OO view is that there is concupiscence for St. Mary as a result of original sin, which was wiped at enunciation. I think that is why we don't accept the Immaculate Conception, but she, of course, did not give in to temptations. Um, and then I, I, I'm actually interested in seeing what, Thomas has to say, because I asked him, would you say Mary had temptations? Um, he would say yes. So he would say yes. Okay, so that's fundamentally different than I think from what you would believe and then what I would believe as a Catholic. Um, we, we don't say that she had, she, we say that she does not, ever, she never had any temptations. Um, of course, uh, internal temptations, right? Even Christ faced external temptations obviously didn't phase him because these are like things that are coming not internally but externally mm -hmm. from the devil to tempt him um to you know to turn these bread and the stones into bread and, and to you know jump from this uh the high building um things like that right but we're not talking about those we're talking about internal temptations did mother mary face temptations <clears throat> did she have temptations to drink get, get drunk did she have temptations to to lust you know god forbid the answer is absolutely not, and and I don't know any father of the church who would even hint at the fact that she had temptations, besides the few that believe that she sinned one time. Yeah, I mean, I would like to see if there are any fathers who say that. I haven't read it, so I'm interested to see. Um, Thomas, if you find any quotes or whatever, just send them over to me. And, yeah, and he says, uh, Christ was tempted merely externally because he could not possibly choose to sin, but St. Mary could have chosen to sin, but she didn't choose to sin. So the question isn't, could she have sinned? The question is, did she have temptations? And uh, the Catholic Church would say, absolutely not. She did not have temptations. No, she did not. Um, and in fact, again, um, so here's another show I would reference people. And, and I, I'm glad that we've done these shows before because then we can always say, hey, watch that show. We've got into this. There's a show we did, if you remember, uh, Subdeacon, um, it was with William Albrecht. It was on William Albrecht's channel, uh, Patristic Pillars, on YouTube. Uh, it was a show we did on the Syriac Fathers and the Immaculate Conception. Uh, we get into uh, the teaching of uh, this book right here, as the homilies in here about uh, Mother Mary. Uh, we get into that, and we talk, and we get into the: Did she have concupiscence? Did she have temptations according to, to Saint Jacob? And I think that we showed that she absolutely did not have temptations according to the Syriac fathers. So it's not just the Catholic teaching, it's the Syriac fathers who are teaching this explicitly. And it, there's no, there really isn't no like middle ground. She absolutely did not have. And I was trying to find um, where the, the passage is um, where he talks about uh, these things. So I don't know if you want to uh, touch up on the, uh, uh, touch up on anything while I try to look for this, if I can, if not, it's no big deal. So let's see. No more questions. There was the rosary question. Oh, got a question scroll up. Where? Okay, how does the eighth month? Well, let me take this real quick. Um, 
Sure. Because I see it and then we'll do the rosary. Yeah. I can't find it yet. So let me see here. Mm -hmm. How does the East come up with something definitive or dogmatic? Does it go by what's unanimous amongst the fathers or councils? Okay. It's for me. Um, so mm -hmm. we uh, we have councils. We have obviously the, the, the three ecumenical that everyone agrees on. And then we have more after um, that hold... Um, some kind of it's like you know how like Lateran has that authority in the West, but it's not counted among the ecumenical councils. We have councils like that, so we have councils throughout the centuries coming up, uh, like through the millennia, whatever. And uh, we have things that are defined there theologically, and we hold them. So um, these are not uh, like usually it, it's it's kind of very. I guess you could say Oriental Orthodoxy might be the most primitive in terms of what's developed as as doctrine and things like that. In my in my personal preference, I, I think that's a good thing. Um, uh, but yeah, it's we, we don't we don't really for the most part there doesn't seem to be like major issues where people are unsure of what of like what we believe. Like people who are actually theologians in the church or whatever, there's not there's not really issues that don't exist in the other apostolic churches that do have um, easier ways of defining dogma. On the contrary, I, I would argue, let's say like the Roman Catholic Church that has maybe the most um, centralized form of defining dogma uh, might even have the most dogmatic disputes within that system. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, I... That's how I would say that's how we have it. Fathers, councils, synods. Perfect. And then let me see here. Let's take a look and see where I can find the rosary question. Do you know where it was or who was it from? Yeah, it was uh, MK Vine at 7, 18, uh, 10, 18, your time. PM. Oh, here it is. Okay, sweet. Yeah. Okay, uh, MK Vine. Question for Subdeacon Daniel. Do the OO have something similar to the rosary? So OO is a communion of five churches. It's... um. Coptic, Alexandria, Syriac, Antioch, Armenia, Ethiopia, Eritrea. Ethiopia, Eritrea are the same rite. So there's four rites. Yeah, four rites and five patriarchates in communion together. So um, these four rites are extremely different. They're completely different churches and rites and traditions and everything, but they share the same faith and they're in communion together and commemorate each other. So the devotions corresponding to that are also extremely different one to the other. In Syriac Orthodoxy, we have no such thing like the rosary. We have no prayer rope, nothing like that. In the Coptic and, and Ethiopian slash Eritrean traditions called Tiwahido, so Coptic and Tiwahido, they do have prayer ropes. Um, Armenians, I think they don't also like us. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Uh, let me see. I don't know if you have any more questions, but I, I, I did find some. Um, well, let's see. Thomas is saying other things here. So let me see what we got. Um, I don't think that the hypothetical possession of concupiscence internally would not endanger St. Mary's stance with God. Um, like literally double negative. Okay. So um, I, I do want to read a section here from uh, some St. Jacob. Oh, um, so Remember when we were just reading about Saint Jacob of uh, the Annunciation, where he's saying she's being purified, her womb's being purified, her, her, her you know, her mind and all these things, her, her status, everything's being purified, right? Now this is before, right? This is before the Annunciation, right? So he's talking about her as a child and growing up. This is what he says. He says she was a person of discernment, full of love of God, because our Lord does not dwell where there is no love. When the great king desired to come to our place, he dwelt in the purest shrine of all the earth because it pleased him. Now he's saying that she's pure, pure shrine. That's where he dwells. Now he's, this is what he says. He says, he dwelt in a spotless womb, which was adorned with virginity and with thoughts which were worthy of holiness. She was most fair, both in her nature and in her will, because she was not sullied with displeasing desires. From her childhood, she stood firm in unblemished upright, uprightness. She walked in the way without offenses. Her original nature was preserved with a will for good things because there were always tokens of virginity in her body and holy things in her soul. Notice what he's saying. 
He says her original nature was preserved with a will for good things because there were always, always, not sometimes, always tokens of virginity in her body and holy things in her soul from, from the beginning, from the beginning, right? It's not just, you know, it started at the Annunciation. This deed which took place in her gave me power to speak these things concerning her ineffable beauty. Because she became mother of the Son of God, I saw and firmly believed that she is the only woman in the world who was entirely pure. From when she knew to distinguish good from evil, she stood firm in purity of heart and in integrity of thoughts. She did not turn aside from the justice, which is the law, and neither carnal nor bodily desire disturbed her. From her childhood, impulses of holiness stirred within her, and in her excellence, she increased them with great care. The Lord was always set before her eyes on him. She was gazing so that she might be enlightened by him and in delighted by, in him. Because he saw how pure she was and limpid her soul, he wanted to dwell in her since she was free from evils. Since a woman like her had never been seen, an amazing work was done in her, which is the greatest of all. And this is why I was saying in the beginning um, that it's not just, hey, she was purified at the Annunciation, period. That's it, right? That's not what he's saying, because he's saying before that she was already she was she already had those things, because he says she she uh, um, she attained those things on her own accord, on, on her own, until the Spirit came and perfected that, right? Um, so uh, I, I would say that uh, with with say Jacob that he's teaching. She did not have these like evil desires or she did not have temptations and um, impulses in her soul where, you know, pulling her to one direction and she's going to that, that's not something you're going to find in the fathers that she had concupiscence. Um, let's see. My good friend, William Albrecht, it is very common among Gios to believe Holy Mary was freed from concupiscence and enunciation. This is simple, does not fit with the Greek of Luke one. Um as Saint Mary is described as full of the sinless uh, Amomos grace, that she is in full possession of even before Gabriel appeared to her. And this is a great point because um, even um, even Saint Jacob, like I said, he's, he keeps calling her pure, uh, full of grace, and all these things at, from childhood, not from from the Annunciation. Um, it, it's not it's not something that starts at the Annunciation. It's something that is perfected at the Annunciation. Right, it's a, it's a growth in holiness, and at the Annunciation, it's like now the 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 perfect the job has been perfected. It's, it's beautiful. Um, it's concupiscence sin. Um, so if if you are in a state of concupiscence, uh, you're in a state of sin. But concupiscence itself is not sin. So that's why um, when when we are um, when we are conceived, we are conceived in a state of death and concupiscence, and that's what makes us in a sense guilty not like guilty because we committed something but our state is dirty and it needs to be washed and and so um in a sense you can say yes it is in a sense you can say no it's not it just depends on how you're you're um um you're, you're asking the question and yes i believe augustine refers to concupiscence as sin in some sense but not sure um that's and that's uh that is uh that is correct let me see if there's any other questions here there's uh, Bo, Bo Duong on involuntary sin at uh, 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 10.22 p.m. 10.22. Wow, I missed so many of these. Go all the way back. What is the understanding of involuntary sin in Syriac Christianity? It seems like a foreign concept in the West. Yeah, there is involuntary sin in Syriac Christianity. We We have to be absolved from it. Uh, every Sunday, uh, voluntary and involuntary sin, conscious and unconscious sin. Um, we, we have a prayer actually before sleep, a hymn that Saint Ephraim wrote that we should be we should sing every night um, to pray that God protects us uh, by the prayers of the Virgin Mary and by His cross from sin. Even in our sleep, we can sin. So there's sinful sleep and there's sleep that there's holy sleep. There's both. Yeah, th that is uh, very interesting because even Father on Saturday was talking about voluntary and involuntary sins are both sins. Um, th did we answer this one? I think we did. Do the no? Do the no, rest? Do the rest of the Orites have different canons than the Ethiopians? I think he means Bible canons. 
Uh, I so, believe so, yes. Mm -hmm. So canon, canon, the Greek word, is a Greek word. We say it also in Arabic, uh, qanun. Um, so the qawanin are different uh, for every church, whether it's a Bible canon or a pastoral canon, it's just canons. Canons in, in the Eastern understanding, Oriental Orthodox understanding, they don't necessarily have to be infallible or inspired. They're simply what is bound upon that community. It could be temporally or whatever. So this, the scriptural canons are based on the lectionary that was received from the apostolic times to that community. So we will all have different scriptural canons because the understanding of scripture to us is maybe different than, let's say, to the Latins in Trent and other, other places. But um, this is not contradicting each other's canons. Like if, a, let's say, the Copt comes to me with Revelation, which isn't canonical for me, but it is for him, I'm not going to tell him Revelation is not scripture get it out of my face i'm going to like <laughs> going to recognize that that is an inspired writing and it was received in alexandria from the apostles even if i my ancestors didn't receive it it's still inspired you know and the same for books that we have that they don't have that's a, always a good question um canon questions i know uh, william albrecht loves that topic um so let's see, my friend, Glenn Guadalupe, he says, not sure if this was answered since I stepped away for about 20 minutes. Please address that the belief of certain Latin Catholics that Mary did not die. I'm Latin, but I believe Mary did die. So, um, yes, I, I, I agree, uh, Glenn. I believe that Mary did die. Um, and there's there's no problem with saying that and still saying she did not have original sin. Because like I said, it's a twofold um, uh, as far as what original sin is. So I, I'm going to read Fundamentals of Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma, again, from Ludwig van Ott. He says this about Mary's death. He says, For Mary, death, in consequence of her freedom from original sin and from personal sin, was not a consequence or punishment of sin. However, it seems fitting that Mary's body, which was by nature mortal, should be in conformity with that of her divine son, subject to the general law of death. So in other words, when we die, we die because we are being we're dying under the punishment of sin or consequence of sin. That's why we die. Um, when Mary died, it wasn't that. It was because she um, was a daughter of Adam and she's imitating her son. Um, that's why she died. It wasn't because of a punishment. And this is very patristic in the sense that the, the Greek fathers and the homilies that they wrote in the Dormitions, this is the kind of um, language they use where they separate her death from our death, they distinguish between the difference. And they say, how could the mother of life who had the son of God in her womb, how could she be, how could she die? How could she be punished? She is life itself. How could death, how could life die? Right? Because she had life in her womb. And so it's not a punishment. So yes, she did die, but it's a different type of death from us. It's not a different type of death. It's the same death, but it's a different reason for why she died, I should say. Um, what, what what do you guys believe as far as Syriac Orthodox? Yeah, we believe she died. The Feast of the Dormition and Assumption of Mary is uh, like solidified into the liturgical rites of the church, the calendar, everything. It, it's not possible to be Oriental Orthodox and not believe in, in it. Um, like, I guess, technically, it's not dogmatized in the same way because of the papal infallibility thing that made it dogma for you guys. But for us, it's in the it's in the rites, like it's in the church. How are you gonna go to the mass and then you're gonna you're gonna hear it? Like there's rites for it that we're doing the prayers and the hymns about it. I'm not gonna say it's wrong. So for us, it's inspired the liturgy, you know. Um, so it's it's uh, it's dogma in. In, a, in the Eastern understanding of how dogma is dogma, we like without a, a declaration of it, it's just if you believe this, then that's why you're here. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Makes sense. And then uh, follow up from Glenn, or it's a continuation. It says, a possibly related issue. I have read in the past that the Syriac Orthodox Church do not believe death as an evil thing. Is this true? Um, yeah, it's true. Uh, I think you and I have talked about it before, uh, Elijah, where there's holy deaths, um, like people who are, you know, they get to a certain point of holiness that uh, God just takes them because they want to taste from his cup like Mary. 
and others, other holy people, uh, uh, where um, in, there's a book called The Book of Steps. Um, uh, this It's an early Syriac writing from the 4th century, probably written on the Persian side of the border. So if we're going to be technical, you could say maybe it's even Church of the East, but it was in a time where the Syriac churches were united as uh, together in communion. So we, everyone, we all use it. And this book, uh, you'll see there's different classes of holy people. There's the, the perfect, the upright, etc. The perfect can get so perfect that they eventually they die. That's how perfect they get. So why is dying a good thing? Because Christ made it good. That everything Christ did, he, he, he restored it. He redeemed that thing. So by dying, that person is united to Christ in his death. That is uh, very profound, as usual, from the Syriac Orthodox. Uh, beautiful teaching there. Um, I don't know. I don't see any other questions. Um, seems like the the questions are more like we're taking more time answering questions than we did the show, which I love. <laughs> yeah, I love questions. Um, <laughs> any, so last call. Did I miss any uh, subject? Do you know if I missed anything? Um, I didn't notice. I think there's one from Mashlama. They had asked about how we we have different rules of faith then, but I, I answered that in the in the in the comments. I oh, okay. Think. And then I, I do see here from the same person, Shlama Lama. Can you tell me how full of is inside Kikiri Tomine? I thought it was translated as a title. You who have been and continue to be graced. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not qualified to answer that question. Um, that's something that William Albrecht would be more qualified to answer that. Um, but my understanding is that um, I don't think full is in there, but like you've been graced. Um, but hey, I, again, I'm not qualified. I'm not going to, please don't, don't quote me on that. The answer is, I don't know the answer to that question. So what, what about you, uh, Subdeacon? If, if I can just say this to any Western Christian listening, when I say Western, I mean anyone who's not Suraya. So anyone who's not Chaldean, Assyrian, Syriac, Anyone else? Uh, always remember, and I, I'm not against the Greek or the Latin. I, I love and respect those traditions and languages very much, and the apostolic origins and very holy. But always remember that in all of this, the dialogue that happened, whether it's between Gabriel and Mary, whether between Jesus and Peter, all these dialogues are happening in Aramaic, right? So when we're saying uh, um, the Hail Mary, uh, in Aramaic, or and I know it's written in Greek, right? It's in Luke wrote in Greek. I know that, but what that was said, what was said in the conversation, was said in Aramaic. So when we say it in Aramaic, the the Aramaic understanding of these things gives the original intention. the The Greek gives you theological like implications, like for example, in the Our Father saying like super substantial bread, you know. The Aramaic, you don't get that. But in the Aramaic, it's like, if you want to know what was actually said on the spot, that's what it was said. Yeah. And, and what was said? Like, So I think people are wondering what was actually said. Uh, the part they're asking about is full of grace. Yeah. Meliath playbuthe. So Meliath. if you, if you, Meliath means full, like if you put a cup to the maximum brim, right? And playbuthe, grace. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so in, in Aramaic, um, you know, we can answer that because like, we pray the Hail Mary, Shlam al or Milith Milith Taibutha. It's like full of grace. Yeah. But I think I think there is still importance, uh, as you kind of alluded to, mm -hmm. uh, to the Greek because the gospel writer chose that word for a reason, right? Um, and, and and I think where there is importance in the Aramaic, just like in the Matthew sixteen, where it's like Petros, Petras, and then um, the rock, there's yeah. still an apologetic thing right yeah, yeah for us it's just kappa that's it right yeah yeah um so i i think it's still a, a fair question to ask in the aramaic there's no question to, right. there's no question to ask it's yes full of grace yeah. um but i think there is so much behind that word in greek there's a whole you can write a book about that right mm -hmm. um and and i think um i i would point you to william albrecht on that question mm. to uh to ask but I like the answer that you gave, Subdeacon. I'm gonna I'm gonna steal that from now on. We say 
gospel of grace. That's all that matters. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see here. Um, any any more questions? Any more questions? Um, don't see any. Does subdeacon believe in and outside the church there is no salvation? Yes. Um. I don't see anything. I think there's a follow up. Oh, okay. But how do we know whether the idea of full is even in there Greek? In the Greek, if it's not in the Greek, we can't know if it's in the Aramaic unless there's something I'm missing. So how do we know it's in the Aramaic? First of all, Who's so that in the, uh, the, the Church of the East, whether Assyrian or Chaldean, the Church of the East and the Church of Antioch, the Syriac uh, tradition together, West and East, they have one scripture. It's called the Pshitta. So the pshitta, that means basit, it's uh, simple. It's the this is the 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 formal official uh, scripture of the Syriac tradition, and um, some of it is translations from Greek, like Luke. Some of it is originally from Aramaic, like Matthew and so, and Hebrews. Some of it, and then the Old Testament, even including the Deuterocanonical, the so-called Deuterocanonical books, even them they're from Hebrew earlier than the Masoretic Hebrew, from a first century Hebrew to Aramaic directly. So in Hebrew to Aramaic, it's very easy. It's a very easy translation. They're very close languages. Things will not get lost, you know. Um, so uh, we will know, we can't know if it's, if it's not in the Greek, we can't know if it's in the Aramaic, unless there's something I'm missing. I don't understand that part. Do you understand that part, Elijah? If it's okay, so he says, uh, how do we know whether the idea of full is even in their Greek in the Greek? If it's not in the Greek, we can't know if it's in the Aramaic. But it, um, okay, well, so okay, here's the thing. I don't know in the Eastern in the Eastern understanding, scripture is part of tradition. So I don't know if that's the same with the West. I don't know if in the West they say it's their scripture and there's tradition. I'm not sure. But it, no, no, same it's, it's yeah, it's 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 scripture is just written tradition. Yeah, it's part of the tradition. So yeah. it's really does it really doesn't matter if the word full is in the, the manuscript or not. It's cannot it's canonized. It's it's just like how the story in John eight with the with the adulteress. It's not real. It's not originally in John, but it's that's it. It's part of the it's part of the the, the fabric of what we've received. The, the deposit of faith that the fathers have delivered to us. So same thing with this understanding full. It's there. Like if it's it has to be in the Greek or not, or tell us. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And and I think the the fathers, when they uh, talk about that title of Mary, uh, uh, full of grace, to carry komine, or however you say it, I'm, I'm, I know I'm butchering it. Um, well, the fathers talk about it as full of grace. So I hope that helps as far as like, the church fathers read it that way. Um, but it is a unique Greek word that is used by Luke um, that you don't really see anywhere. Because I know that the full of grace is used elsewhere um, in the scriptures. Uh, I think it was to describe St. Stephen um, when he was martyred. I can't remember, but it, it uses it in the literal sense. Like, hey, he's full of grace, not a title full of grace. So it's different, right? She's mm -hmm. given that title, kind of like the title of um, Christ that's given Emmanuel, right? It's a title. It's not just a name. Hey, it's a title that he's, God is with us. Um, I don't see any more questions. Um, any any final thoughts, Subdeacon? Yeah, let me just correct myself. I, I used the wrong vowel earlier. It's Meliath Tebutha, not Tebuthi. My fault. Oh, I thought you were going to say Tebutho. Yeah, Tlaibutha in the West, but uh, yeah. you speak Surat, so I was telling you Tlaibutha. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's the, the Chaldeans and the Syriac, may they fight over everything. The the translation, <laughs> is it Alaha or Aloho? You know, yeah, it's, it's just it's just a vowel mark. The, the letter is the same. It's the same. same. Like, they'll yeah. come and read the same thing, but the reader is different. So if yeah. I'm reading it and he's reading it, we're going to read it different. But the text is the same text. Yeah. You know, it's really funny. Um, yeah. There's another question here. I'll answer this as the last one because uh, we do have to end it at some point. Elijah, what do you think about Mary as co-redemptrix? It's so funny that um, you, you would ask this question on the topic with a Syriac Orthodox uh, brother here because 
I, I've I've seen the uh, co-redemptrix and the fathers, and specifically in Saint Ephraim, um, and it, it's a it's a um, type of teaching where it, logically that's what you would come up with. For example, so uh, we believe there was a, a first Adam, a second Adam, and a serpent, and then we believe there was a second Adam, a second Eve, and um, whatever, like uh, the angel Gabriel that came to Mary and um, uh, told her, you know, you would be the son of, you're going to conceive the son of God. So um, I, I I hope that this is never something that's ever dogmatized um, in the Catholic Church, because I think it'll just create more barriers, right? Um, but I, I do see, I do see this teaching having some merit in the fathers, but not enough to where it needs to be dogmatized because really we shouldn't be dogmatizing so many Marian teachings, right? Uh, because once you dogmatize something, then what you're saying is, look, if you don't believe this, you're not Catholic, orthodox. Yeah. you're not Orthodox, right? You're not saved in a sense, right? Essentially um, as a Catholic, right? So I hope it's never something that is taught as a dogma. I hope it continues as a theological opinion, which I myself have no issues with. Um, and I, I think there's beauty behind it, um, where, speaking logically, the mother of God, the fact that she is the mother of God, she conceives God himself who dies on the cross. So yes, there is a co-redemptrix in that sense that she is redeeming. But the word co, it's not, we're not saying equal. Like, of course, his what Christ did is infinitely greater than what Mary did by conceiving Christ and, 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 and having Christ and raising him and all that stuff. Um, so, of course, we have to talk about the, the primacy of Christ, right? It's not, not like they're equals. Um, but she does play a role in salvation because without her, this is the way God chose for things to happen. So without her, there's no, um, there's no son of God being born through a, a woman uh, named Mary. So, um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on on that. Something yeah, uh, there is. Uh, Ephraim says things like this. He makes it seem like, like Mary did all of humanity a huge favor, um, and th there was no other option. Uh, but every Syriac, it's we like we can't say we can't say this word. <laughs> you know, we can't like from the highest level to the lowest level. It's uh, it's like taboo to say the word. Oh, is that you call me dumb tricks or something? Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. I can't even say it in Arabic or anything. Oh, like, okay. We, we've like, taken out hymns because they say this kind of thing. So it's so, not like you're saying it's, it's like taking God's name in vain. You can't say it. You just can't no, say no. it because just there's it's no bad. translation. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's like we're Im importing something and it's, it makes sounds sense. weird. Like Sharikat al Fida. It's like Sharikat al Fida. How can there be? And then it comes this blasphemous misunderstanding yeah. of something. Makes so, sense. Um, and then. Yeah, so the translation, you're right. Um, and then there's also, though, I noticed something last uh, liturgy, uh, we were we said, not this last, the one before it, the New Year's liturgy, we uh, we said about Mary, um, I can't remember what the Syriac was, but it was like mother of the peoples, mother of the, of the nations, right? So I remembered in the Latin conversation right now, there's like a theological opinion of, do we say she's the mother of the church or the mother of everybody or something like that? Right. You guys. So in, in the, in, if we're taking it isolated, the mother of the peoples, but what does peoples mean? And peoples means the, the Gentiles, because there's always in the Syriac tradition, if you're not Syriac, you don't know that this is because the, the hymn is not saying it. So you have to be familiar with what's surrounding what's, when is the when are these terms used in the Syriac tradition? It's always peoples versus the synagogue, peoples versus synagogue. Always, there's like a lot of dialogue poems of one versus the other. So Mary is the mother of this group. That's what it's saying. The, meaning the church, the church who are the Gentiles who are against the synagogue. That's what. But it's like it's easy to see it and be like, oh, well, she's the mother of everybody. But that's actually not the context of what that would mean. Makes sense. Makes sense. Okay, sweet. Well, hey, uh, Subdeacon, I, I thank you for, for coming on. I know we went almost two hours. Uh, thank you for your time um, and your knowledge. 
um, for gracing us with all this beauty and, and the fact well, that glory to God. Thank you. Elijah. Amen. I appreciate it, bro. And it's beautiful because, you know, we just did the show and um, just kind of like, hey, we're, we're, we teach the same thing. Right. It's the same. It's, it's the same teaching. And uh, essentially in the dogmatic level, there are other like nuances, things that we might disagree on that our churches haven't defined. But at least on the dogmatic level, it's, it's something that um, we can find both affirming the teaching, um, essentially. So thank you, everybody, for, for tuning in, for listening. Uh, I always appreciate it. So don't forget to like, share this, subscribe, and please uh, comment below what you guys thought about the show, uh, what you guys' belief is. It, it, it also helps with getting this show out there. The more people comment, the more uh, the algorithm will have YouTube post this, uh, promote this show in a sense. Um, so I appreciate that. So everybody have a, a blessed night and uh, God bless you.